Virtual attendees crave the personalized experience of an in-person event. A custom curated gift box is the perfect way to give them that experience. No matter the theme of your event, PC Name Tag is here to help you make it memorable. With a custom kit of branded gifts, from coffee mugs to yoga mats, your virtual attendees will feel engaged and connected throughout their experience. Sign up for a free consultation by visiting pcnametag.com slash virtual kits. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, global friends and community members. My name is Jesse States. I'm the director of the MPI Academy at Meeting Professionals International. Welcome to our She Means Business program, the second day of programming associated with this joint event of IMEX and TW Magazine in partnership with MPI. She Means Business is an international conference about diversity, gender equality, and female empowerment, not just for women in business and women in events, but also their male counterparts. It is all about celebrating the role of women in business and women in events. I encourage you to chat. Use the chat as much as you like. Uh, use it to engage. Use it to share best practices, to agree or disagree with something our panels are saying. Uh, really engage with each other. Use this opportunity to share stories about your leadership and your roles within the current crisis and beyond. But if you have questions, I'd like for you to use the Slido system. This is so that we can really follow along and be able to find the questions without them getting lost in your amazing conversations and discussions. So in order for us to be able to bring some of your questions to the panel, make sure that you're using the Slido question and answer tab. All of that can be found to your right. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our panel for today's session. First, I needs no introduction, is Karina Bauer, uh, the CEO of IMEX Group. Uh, she joined the business at the original launch of the very first show. This is her second now digital Planet IMEX program. She's served in leadership roles for all of the industry's biggest associations, including including currently at site, and she's a mentor for the Fast Forward 15 for women in hospitality and women in events. Then I have Flavie Badeau. Uh, she's the acting head of European Cities Marketing. She uh, works within that organization to improve the competitiveness and performance of leading cities in Europe, and she's responsible for really all aspects of running that organization. Julie Coker is the president and CEO of the San Diego Tourism Authority, where she works to promote the destination to audiences and global travelers. Uh, she just recently served as the past president and CEO of uh, Philadelphia Convention and Visitors Bureau, uh, where she oversaw the NFL draft and the Democratic National Convention, which brought in $325 million collectively to Philadelphia. Uh, and then uh, Christine uh, or Shimo uh, Shimasaki is the managing director of To Synergize. Uh, she's a consultant in our industry who is a faculty member at SDSU's master's program. Uh, and she also uh, formerly worked for Destinations International. The reason that we've chosen this diverse group of panelists is to bring you a variety of perspectives when it comes to the marketplace and women in leadership. So we've got an association, we have a corporate, we have uh, a destination management organization, and then we also have someone from the consultancy side. So really taking a look at the breadth of women's leadership uh, within our industry and, and really how that's being impacted by the current crisis and how these amazing women are leading their clients, their organizations, their staff in our industry forward. So I'd love to start with Karina. Karina, this is an incredible event. We're now on day two of uh, your second version of this uh, digital Planet IMAX. Uh, what is the leadership uh, environment look like at, at IMAX during the past few months? 
Hi, Jesse. Hello to everybody. Great to be on the panel. Um, yeah, you know, I think like, um, you know, many organizations in our industry, we've been going through a huge amount of change. And really, the leadership over the past few months is about managing change and managing uncertainty um, for both um, internal teams and also for clients as well. Um, like many people in the industry were like, like everybody who's an event organizer, uh, all our events have been cancelled um, and so there are a number of things that need to be done in terms of leading an organization through that kind of change because of course that's devastating when that is what your organization does and so there's a need I think for both um, in terms of leadership uh, for the internal team but also clients to lead with um, extreme transparency, actually, um, and and certainty. And, and what I mean by that is you can't be certain of the circumstances, but you can give certainty, certainty in terms of how you are making the decisions and how you're going to communicate those decisions. And I think that's really, really important in a period like this, because, of course, you might make a decision one day and it might need to change a week later or a month later. And so I think it's very important that as you're making those decisions, you're taking people with you, you're explaining the reasoning behind those decisions and also giving some degree of certainty as to how you're making decisions so that they can also project forward because you can't hide anything from anybody. You can't pretend it's all okay and that you have the answers for six months time because actually none of us do. And so the key I think is to give people the the means by which they can also project themselves forward a little bit and, and think it through. And, and the other thing I suppose I've always had is an open door. And so I've always tried to be very open and, and hear people out. And the other thing I guess I've learned is um, you know, you can't say the same thing too many times. You can't communicate too often, uh, both internally and also um with clients um so I, I know we don't have too long so i won't i won't sort of do more of a monologue we're very happy to answer any questions no i, I think that that's really critical when you're thinking about uh, not only leading the organization but you've got to get everyone's buy-in right they have to be comfortable with the decisions that the organization's making too how did you how did you provide that steady environment for everyone so that they could they could feel comfortable and safe uh within the organization during the time yeah, well, I think that does come back to um, transparency, really, um, especially when you're needing to make difficult decisions or deliver difficult messages. I think that transparency is really key so that it's a safe environment for people to ask any questions. So there's no silly questions. And um, for us, we did that in a number of ways. So we held town halls for our team, but we also prior to those town halls sent out surveys and we answered at every question that came up and I think that's really important not to hide behind anything in these kind of times and, and um, sometimes that might take a personal conversation with some, somebody but I sort of took the view that if people were writing and asking questions in that environment that probably other people had the same type of question so it's about looking for patterns and um, sometimes you know you have to put yourself in those uncomfortable positions to ask and handle those difficult questions that come up. And sometimes it is about saying that you don't have all the answers, but that's okay. Um, because again, that's honest and transparent. And I think in the early days as well, so it's showing some emotion, you know, the when I was talking to the team about the fact that we had to cancel IMEX in Frankfurt, that was very emotional for me personally. And um, it was okay to show that to the team and to show them that that was okay for them to be emotional as well, but that we could get through it together. So it was about creating that sense of team and that sense of community um, was, I think, very powerful for all of us. I'm getting a little emotional to, uh, hearing you say that uh, because I think that that the the cancellation of IMEX, both the Frankfurt show and the America show, um, was devastating to a lot of people, including myself. Uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, it wasn't just staff that needed that that space; it was it was your whole community, your IMEX community, that needed that. What what 
after coming out of this, you you know, what were some of the big takeaways or lessons that you you were like, wow, that that changed me, or that changed the way that I'm going to approach things in the future? Well, I guess um, to a degree, you know, we're all changed by this, these circumstances, because this is the kind of thing that you watched in a movie, but it was never going to happen to us, right? Um, so we all change to a degree. I, I think that the leadership styles that we have performed through this crisis are probably um, sort of the extreme version, hopefully, of you know what we've all been doing anyway. And so I think you know one of the things is just not to be scared of any conversation in a way, and that that transparency and and the. The, the other thing that I've learned is trying to unpick the uncertainty and find some core in the middle of certainty to give to people, whatever that is, however small it is. So to make some decisions, that's really important. I think one of the things I'm struggling with here in the UK with our politics is that um, the leadership of the country seems to be blowing in the wind. And I look at um, how we've done things. I look at what other businesses are doing. And you have to find something to anchor yourself on. And that's really important. You have to be able to say, look, X, Y, Z, there, there are all these different scenarios out there. But within all of these, this is a commonality and we can make a decision on this. We can do this. And I think that's really important. And, and people need that to have some hope and they need that to work positively towards something. So, you know, it's something like Planet IMEX. It's been fabulous, I think, I hope for the global meetings and, and business events communities brought people together that that's what we wanted to do but it's also been so valuable for us as a team because not only has it given us a direction and something positive to hold on to uh, but we've also learned so much and there's a joy in learning it's difficult but there's also a joy in that process and you can see that that we as a as a company have learned new skills and that's also important as well and it helps people to project forward for themselves into the future that they have those skills now that are going to be really important in our new virtual hybrid world when we go back to our live events really what you're you're talking about is is a, a resiliency that that everybody needs and, and julia i'm going to go to you now you know how have you found that resiliency in, in your work with, with the dmo world sure so i've, I've been fortunate because i've I started the COVID world, we'll call it, um, in Philadelphia and then joined San Diego in June. So I had an opportunity to experience it in both cities. Um, I, I would, I think the word resilient is absolutely perfect. And I agree with so much of what Karina said, especially when it comes to transparency, because lack of communication definitely allows your vendors, customers, and more importantly, your team to just go off in different directions that are probably not the direction you're going to go in. So if you as a leader didn't communicate often and timely and as succinct as possible, um, it definitely caused confusion, uh, especially amongst your team. So for DMOs, I think we quickly pivoted and focused really on three key things. And the first thing for most DMOs was financial, right? And, and I say that because our, most DMOs are funded by hotel tax. Well, hotels were shut down and they weren't able to hold uh, guests except for essential workers. So immediately your revenue source was cut off. Um, and certainly you had to shore up, what does my reserve look like? What are other revenue sources that I can tap into? What, quite honestly, decisions do I need to make in regards to staffing and or programming immediately? So on day one, you had to immediately go into that that focus. And then the other was you needed to start um, to pivot towards advocacy. And as Karina said, you know, I like the, the very correct political statement of politics has played a interesting role in all of this for all of us, unfortunately, in some ways good, in some ways bad. And we needed to immediately uh, pivot to advocacy to talk to not only local government, but state government about at least opening up hotels for leisure visits. Um, essential workers were already allowed, um, but we had, to, we had to get some traction because we had no revenue. In addition to that, most DMOs are membership organizations. So you also needed to worry about your cultural attractions, 
your restaurants, small businesses. For example, in San Diego, 70% of visitor spend goes into small businesses. Uh, and so that is a huge number. And so therefore we had to immediately start advocating on behalf of our industry, but also on behalf of our members. And then lastly, also you had to educate, you had to educate your meeting planners. Many of them had meetings that were to take place the next day. And what does that look like for them? And how do I get out of these contracts? And can I shift my meeting? Should I move it to August? Should I move it to September? Um, and so you had to you know, educate them on, this is what I know right now. Uh, this is what my city or state is allowing to be held in my destination. This is what I can do for you. Your salespeople immediately flipped into helping customers move meetings as quickly as they possibly can. And all the while you're doing this with very limited information. We had never been through anything like this before. Uh, so you really had no idea. I mean, I'll be the first one to say Philadelphia, we went uh, to stay in place on March 17th. I really thought mm, by the end of March, we're going to be back in the office and then obviously extended. And then the last piece I'll say is that we all pivoted to is to our staff. Um, I 100% I agree with Karina. It, you have to show emotion with that. When you're, when you're letting tenure people go and you're having to do it like this because you can't talk to them in person and you can't meet with them in person. And so you've got to tell them that you're financially um, unable to keep them on. And so you have to move them to uh, unemployment status or furlough. Uh, and they've worked for you for 10, 15, 20 years. It is emotional. It's very emotional. And then just to, to, to be able to communicate to staff that has is very outgoing and friendly people and like to be around people. Now they're indoors. They're in a, some in a one room apartment and some live by themselves. So how are they dealing with the isolation if they are alone? So there were a lot of um, wellness checks that needed to be done and just making sure that everyone was okay. Because I've always felt if the leader is okay, then that sets the tone for the culture for everyone else. And everyone else can kind of breathe. If you are scattered and unsure and, and um, not in control, uh, then that sets off bells and whistles for the rest of the team. But that doesn't mean that you can't be emotional because these were very difficult times for all of us and we had to make very difficult decisions. Were there any, uh, were there any unexpected impacts or unexpected things that, that bubbled up during the crisis? Absolutely. I think most DMOs really... Um, uh, started in, in leaning more into government and saying, how can we help you? How can we communicate to not only residents, but also to our customers? So um, here in San Diego, we're very fortunate. Uh, leisure travel came back as early as June 12th. And so we did immediately a safe traveler's pledge saying to customers that were coming to the destination, we're doing two things. One, we're educating our staff and our hotels and they have great safety protocols in place and we've got great signage and people are wearing masks and we are following CDC guidelines. But at the same time, we expect you, if you're coming to San Diego, you're going to need to follow those same guidelines as well. Um, and so we did much more inward communication and, and really lockstep with obviously our county health department, who would probably none of us had to speak to them in the past, which is a good thing. But now they are our best friends and they are on speed dial. And then also, too, I remember in Philadelphia, we immediately, fortunately, they have a life science congress there. We immediately leaned into the medical community and, and they were able to secure a, if you will, medical guru to be their guidance, to be their um, uh, kind of person on the shoulder to run things by and say, that sounds good. You might want to try this or that. So we immediately shifted from a, you know, we'll keep San Diego warm for you to here are safety protocols, which none of us had to necessarily be concerned with before. Gloves, masks, cleaning supplies, UV lights. These are things that we didn't necessarily have to do before. So uh, we are all much more educated. But like I said to someone yesterday, who would have thought 19 years ago we would have had to take off our shoes in the airport? And we do. And we're OK with it. And we don't travel with more than three fluid ounces. And, and we're stronger because of it. And, and this, too, we'll get through this. We'll get it a little longer than we all want it to be, but we're certainly going to get through this. 
Flavi, go, going to you now from the 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 con, from the continent, from the European perspective. What, what's happened? What's been happening the last few months? Uh, well, uh, for us, this uh, COVID crisis had um, you know impacted us you know straight straightly. Um, we had our uh, conference plan on the 11th of March. So I don't know if you recall the um, uh, the calendar. It was just before the week we were all you know under lockdown or at least under restrictions. And about like two weeks before, we were wondering, and we were still considering that is why the virus that could not, you know, hit us so strongly. That's our willingness to to meet and and to give that very positive message uh, would be stronger. Um, but then at the same time, we were again, uh, you know, shared between um, those feelings and and some more realistic ones about you know uncertainty and and the risk of. Uh, you know, uh, gathering all the people and the um, ability for them to come. So that was a complete uh, dilemma. But um, in those, you know, very um, strong situations and so on, again, it was a matter of, um, you know, uh, leading the organizations with um, soft skills and really um, communicating. I'm, I'm really like uh, supporting what, what Karina was saying with um, transparent communication uh, was uh, was key and um, transparency we had some regular board meetings uh, regular conversations with our members how many of you would be ready to travel would be allowed to travel would be safe enough to travel um, so that was the big challenge and all of that uh, was uh, could be successful by a clear communication with the board members uh, in clear communication with the, um, the the rest of the membership, and we were really like ready to go. We had made our decision, and then the day after, we were completely forced to you know take the opposite decision. So again, we we, we had to redo this process, and communication was key. It was again sort of emotional thing, and this is where uh, actually the um, the soft skills are. Uh, really key, you know, in, in, in managing such uh, situations. I would say uh, clear communication and um, self-control as well, while also being human and emotional. Um, I would say both are uh, very uh, important. What key lessons did you learn about yourself and your leadership during this time? And, and kind of what advice would you give to other leaders based on that? Um, yeah, again, it's about, you know, uh, keeping conversations uh, with the members as well, because most of the time they, they also need to be um, uh, involved into that decision process too. Uh, that means uh, if, if, they, if, if you manage to, to take them with you on board, then, then, then you are absolutely on the safe side and, and they, will, they will actually uh, follow up what you, what you decide. Um, what, uh, what is also important is to keep the relationship with the staff and that was again, and I'm lucky enough to have a um, strong and committed uh, staff with me. We are just four people, but um, uh, this, is, um, uh, this was actually, uh, we were all in the same boat and again there is this sense of collectiveness that, that is very important and that all the decisions together with the staff and together with the board are taken in full um, uh, you know, you know, in full agreement. Um, that was key. And um, uh, again, a little bit of um, assertiveness, meaning that the decision you take is, um, is is yours, but it was a collective one. And, and then this is our new um, this is our new uh, goal for the next. I mean, depending on the topic, uh, weeks or months. But um, doesn't mean that we cannot revise it. But um, but that you know, the power of setting the goals. All together. Shimo, let's go to you now. Um, what would you say is is kind of the 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 overall picture of, of your business right now? Well, you know, it's um, it you know as a consultant, uh, we're sort of geared to uh, help uh, our clients solve problems, and certainly there's an abundance of that currently. Um, so I've um, I, I think that what I've observed is that, you know, it, it's taking a look at where we are from our fundamental practices. 
And while there's a lot changing, I think that fundamental practices are um, something to always kind of take a look at in terms of uh, an organization's core competencies. And it, it makes me think about a practice that I have that I, I get up every morning and I try to read something, you know, inspirational. I try to read something spiritual. So this morning when I got up, that, that message was, is that we, we all have what it takes. And with that confidence, what it means to me is that we all have what it takes to take on new perspectives, um, meaning that when when we work with with organizations and individuals, we try not to grasp, you know, really what's going to be right or wrong, because in today's environment, uh, certainly there's a lot of gray area. So I think that we can adopt a number of practices that would help us sort of really understand how to take on new perspectives quickly. And when we're agile and, and we have that mindset of understanding what's going on from different perspectives, it really helps with um, taking uh, action uh, as we as we bring our staffs uh, or as we bring our organizations and our industries forward. Those fundamental practices that help a business be agile during a crisis like this, how much, how much, uh, what is the importance data plays in that? Well, certainly um, we're at a very interesting point where we have a lot of data and then we find ourselves um, needing more data. Um, that we find that there's gaps of uh, information that, that we don't necessarily have. Um, but as we try to distill more information that's coming at us to help us form decisions, one of the techniques I find um, kind of helpful is to create a, a matrix of this information because most of us are, are pretty visual. So when we're able to kind of isolate the sources and then on the top, try to define some themes. Uh, those are kind of information that helps us understand what we're missing, what isn't um, available to us so that we can actively seek that out. So, you know, information comes in a lot of different sources. And the key to it all, whether it's data or whether it's uh, more contextual in nature, um, the key to it is really to, to bring out insights uh, that could form the basis of your decision making. So I think that, you know, being able to um, organize the information coming at us is critical because there can be just, it can create a lot of clutter. Okay, well, let's let's pretend that you are, have a superpower, and that superpower is seeing twelve months into the future. Uh, what do you, what would you predict or expect to change within our industry in those twelve months? Wow, that that's a that's a pretty good question, Jesse. You know, I think that um, what what we know is that um, our jobs are changing. And I think that you could sit back and say, well, you know, I, I know what I know and, and this is what I'm going to do. Or you have a choice um, of saying, you know what, I think I might need to get better at um, being able to understand uh, Excel better or pivot tables or get a little bit more analytical or I could improve, you know, my knowledge of uh digitization of events, or I could up my skill set in a number of different ways. And so I think that what we'll see is that our jobs are going to be changing. And I think they're going to be changing for the better because it's going to challenge us to um, take on new uh, interests. And uh, also, it's going to cause us to lean into maybe areas that we may not be so comfortable, which I think is is okay. I think that is really what's going to call us to sort of lean in and learn new skills. Okay, 
Uh, let's open it up to the audience, to our community, because they have questions that they want answered and, and they've been upvoting the questions that they really want to, you to discuss. And the first one is around difficult conversations. And Julie, you touched on this kind of briefly when you were talking about your staff and those difficult conversations that you were having with them. What is your approach to a difficult conversation and how would you recommend people move forward with those? So, you know, I'll, I'll first start in it. And I think Karina said it first is, is transparency. Um, what I've always said to my team over the years, and it was even more prudent during COVID is if I know at 8 a.m., you're going to know at 8.05. So timeliness of it. I'm, I'm not going to hold something back. Uh, I'm not going to let you sit and wonder. I, I will if I if if I know it, you know it. And if I can answer it, I certainly will. And if I'm unsure I, or I need to go back, uh, then I certainly you know will do that and come back to you you know with answers. Um, I, I also think that you, you have to put on that compassionate hat because you know for many of us. Not only were you speaking to an employee that you might have to lay off or furlough, but you never know their partner, husband, wife might also be furloughed. And so, you know, that's the other situation or they might have children or, um, you know, just other life decisions that they're trying to make. So you do have to put yourself in their shoes. But at the same time, you have to be honest. You have to be direct and you have to let them know um, that you understand that this is difficult for everyone and you have to explain your decisions. I, I, I totally agree. I don't remember who said it. You, you could not over communicate in this situation. You, you, you just couldn't. Um, and so I, that's what I would say about the difficult decisions um, is transparency, but also timeliness. Don't, don't let too much time go uh, between something occurring or decisions that you make. I think it was Karina that that was actually uh, talking about that. Karina, would you add anything about difficult conversations that you've had? Um, would totally agree with everything Julie said. And you know, when Julie talked about um, compassion, I, I do believe that. And it's about listening and empathy. And you know, sometimes when you have the difficult conversations, you get very caught up in how it makes you feel and your nervousness to have that difficult conversation. So you have to learn that it's not about you; it's about the other person. So putting yourself in their shoes. And, and really thinking through what it means to them, true empathy, that's very, very important in any situation really, but even more so right now. Bobby, uh, what has been the most challenging moment of your career thus far? And what did you learn from that challenge? Um, I think through uh, my my ECM career, um, we've had you know many different challenges, but I guess this this crisis is coming you know to a next level. Um, I would say um, now it's about how to really like adapt and stay relevant as an organization keeping you know listening to our members keeping listening to the industry and put that um chemistry all together and adapt our our action plan adapt our 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 discussions our topics and and i would say this is the most difficult one is is basically now um um yeah yeah, as far as I can. Shimo, same question. You have a historied career in our industry. Um, and, and what is this the moment that's been the most challenging? Or have you been through something that that was more challenging for you than this? Well, I think this is a this is pretty challenging. Um, I um, I think one of the biggest decisions is whether or not to continue to innovate or not. Um, you know, I. I, I really love to help the industry solve some problems. And therefore I was at a, this, this point of whether or not to go forward with a product and a solution that I felt that um, the industry needed or my clients needed. And it would have been easy to sort of retrench from that. So it was really, do we continue to push forward? And the answer is yes, because if it's relevant, it will be successful, and it and uh, I think it just causes us to up our game about how we um, how we serve 
the, the industry. This question, uh, we'll start uh, with Julie um, from the DMO perspective. What new skills uh, for our for our destination management organizations or for the salespeople who are out there? What net new skills are they going to need to have for kind of a future ready career post crisis? Sure. So the first thing I'm going to say is, you know, from an advocacy standpoint, right? And 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 I think over the last couple of years, DMOs have gotten much more involved in fine tune that message, but I think now it requires a strategy. So it is. It should not be an afterthought. It should be just as you are doing your, um, you know, executive retreat or board retreat uh, strategy around advocacy to local and state uh, uh, elected officials needs to be a part of that, and it needs to be 365 days a year. So you need to consistently communicate with them the highs, the lows, the importance of of the industry. Um, you know, and why the work that you do matters and the taxes that our industry generates and the visitors that we bring to the destination, why it matters, the fact that it funds police, fire and so forth, especially in the United States in terms of the hotel taxes generated and what it's used for. So that's the first thing I would say is that DMOs need to refine that and it needs to be more of a priority. Um, the other thing I would say is as any membership organization um, making sure that we are listening to hear. Oftentimes we listen to respond, right? So you're listening and you're already, as someone's talking, you're already thinking about what you want to say. In this moment, and, and I think it's a skill set that we should move forward with, is listen to hear. Hear what your members need, hear what your customers need, hear what your teams need, and then formulate that uh, approach and stance. But I think we've all seen as a as a membership organization, those that have fared well during this time, businesses are still paying their membership dues. And, and they may need to go on a payment plan, they may need to extend it, but they, it, they're willing to pay it because you have shown them some sort of value. And so any membership organization during this time really needed to pivot and lean into what we were doing and making sure that we were meeting our members where they are and understanding that one size does not fit all and, and some businesses needed this and some needed that, but making sure that you were meeting all of those needs. And I'm not sure that we were doing that as well as we could have uh, prior to COVID, but we certainly will do it much better coming out of COVID. Uh, Shimo, uh, new, new skills taking uh, this industry forward? Well, I'm not sure about how much it'll take the industry forward, but for myself personally, um, I just got back into golfing. And, um, you know, I think that taking on activities and, and it really helps um, any, any leader to really balance and, and get some space and, and think about, um, you know, in golf, you know, I've always learned that you have to take what the course gives you. And I've always found a lot of great analogies uh, in my business life on the golf course. So um, just like I like to continue to improve myself in my professional realm, um, I like to do that on the personal as well. Uh, we have time for just one more question, and I'll direct it to Karina, who is the um, the CEO of the organization that's putting on this incredible panel and this this great event. Um, what is one new practice that you've adopted? that you plan on keeping as part of you, as part of your leadership, as part of your organization? What's one new practice uh, that everyone can take away and perhaps uh, innovate and use moving forward? Um, I guess it's, you know, nothing new really. Like Shimo said with taking up golf, it's just trying to really think through um, making some time actually so just me whatever that means is it's golf or running uh playing piano i did some diy when the summer was good uh, you know nice weather here um but actually all of those things have the same impact in the sense of it's uh, usually i put on a podcast or listen to some music and it's about a decompression and taking a bit of time and uh, i think that's really important uh, as i say it's nothing radical or new but remembering to do it is 
is important. Uh, and I think the other thing is just really thinking through what's necessary and trying to get to the heart of what your strategy is going to be, whether that's personal or, or your business or in your career, uh, because there's so much coming at us right now. And there, there always was, you know, we live in a busy world. But at the moment, there's so much coming at us. There's so much you, that you can do potentially. Uh, you know, here in the UK, uh, the government's telling people to retrain. Doesn't matter if you're out of a job, retrain. You know, and, and it's difficult. What do you, you know, where, where do you start with those things? So I think just taking some time, having a pause, and and uh, it's something I need to constantly remind myself that it's okay to pause uh, because that gives you time to think. And at moments, I have done that. I wouldn't say I'm perfect at it, um, but that's really the thing that I, I'm going to try to um, do more of it and, and take forward. Thank you so much, Karina. Thank you so much to the rest of our panelists. Julie Coker with Sandy, San Diego Tourism Authority, uh, Flavie Baudot with ECM, and Christine uh, with, uh, with uh, Two Synergize. Thank you all so incredibly much for your time, uh, and, and, and have a wonderful rest of Planet IMAX to all of you. <laughs>